I'm really excited about this lecture. Without teaching any advanced topics, it will enable you to write your own codes to simulate a half-wave dipole antenna. Well, uh, personally, I found it so interesting that I thought I would summarize this video in such a document as you see here, and maybe, only maybe, submit it for publication. Well, regarding its uh, educational importance. Uh, this lecture, well, there, uh, there are some formatting changes too. Unlike previous lectures, uh, here I have already written my notes uh, about the lecture, about the theory, and simply present them here, which uh, shortens the time of the lecture compared to when I was just um, writing as I was speaking. But uh, th the key point of this lecture is that it is combining two simple concepts to simulate a half-wave uh, dipole antenna. One, tangent field on the wire must be zero. Two, this tangent field can be determined by breaking down the half-wave dipole into Hertzian dipole, which is the most basic topic in any antenna course. Uh, so this is in comparison to uh, where more advanced uh, methods have to be used so that you can simulate your, your dipole. So, so the key point is that you don't have to use those advanced methods. As soon as you are uh, taught the dipole antenna, the Hertzian dipole, uh, then you can actually write, start writing your own codes to simulate a half-wave dipole antenna, which is a more practical one. Then we are going to compare the results to a uh, conventional method of moments uh, that the code uh, for which are downloaded from the website of a book. Uh, but first, let's continue where we left off uh, the theory last time. So let's get started with today's lecture. In today's lecture, lecture three, we're going to be talking about first vector potential functions. We're going to follow up from where we left off uh, in our previous lecture and, and couldn't quite finish off. And then we're going to move on to electromagnetics, simple Hertzian dipole, which is uh, bas the, the basic of uh, any antenna course. And based on that, uh, we're going to with the help of ChatGPT, we're going to write our own codes to simulate a half-wave dipole antenna. So half-wave dipole antenna is the probably the uh, simplest, the most practical and simplest uh, antenna that you can think about. And being able to write your own codes to simulate that will basically deepen your knowledge of electromagnetics. The codes that you're going to write here uh, are based on a slightly modified version of method of moment since the original the more conventional or the conventional method of moments is based on some uh, rather advanced concepts such as Pocklington integrals and such here we're going to use it use a slightly uh, different version of it so this is where we left off from last week we got this uh, formula considering that we have a material uh, filled with magnetic dipoles and M represents uh, the the magnetic loops momentum or we're going to determine the uh, curl of uh, this B here so you're going to see that only this part is is going to be important and uh, now we're going to do that computation we're going to do that calculation based on uh, a similar analogy based on an analogy to a similar problem we had before so consider uh, the definition of uh, magnetic field consider the definition of or, or what we call the vector potential and so if your vector potential is this then curl of this vector potential is B and then curl of B is this function so that function is basically this j here or this part 
so similar to that, we can consider that this um, curl of M is of similar concept. So curl of B is going to be basically this, uh, uh, the numerator of this fraction, which is here, curl of m divided by inverse of um, mu zero. So curl of b is equal to curl of m divided by mu zero. And as you see, I get rid of the sign s here for the source coordinate system because when we have the uh, differential uh, format basically uh, those two are the same source and observation points are the same so we don't need them so now we are at a good uh, point here assume that I am interested in the total magnetic field so which is going to be a BF plus B, uh, BB and uh, the first part we know from uh, the previous lectures and this one we just learned. So I see that there's a curl here and there's a curl here. So I get tempted to move this part to this, to uh, the um, left-hand side like this. Uh, and so now it's tempting that now that I have curl of one, um, one term here like this, I, uh, I get tempted to give it a name. I call it H, magnetic field intensity. So if this was the flux, and this is the field intensity now, uh, the good thing is that when we consider a curl of H, it is simply equal to J. We don't have to consider uh, the permeability of the material we are in. It is simply equal to J. All right, so now we can move on to time varying fields, uh, which are caused by, by charge sources and by current sources, which are variant with, uh, varying with time. So we know from Faraday's law, the curl of E is equal to minus uh, derivative of B uh, with respect to T. And we have this equation which is called continuity equation and that's important because this equation uh, tells us that uh, if you take the divergence of J which means that how much charge is coming out of an enclosed um, surface consider a small sphere so how much current is going out of it so no charge is being created somewhere, right? So if some current is going out, if some current is going out, that means that if some current is going out, it means that some charges here, which uh, were pre previously here, now they are not here, they go out. So it means that the charge here goes down and this negative sign basically uh, explains that. If, if we didn't have this continuity equation, so what's going to happen is that you simply write curl of B is equal to J over mu inverse. And how's that going to work? Curl of uh, d divergence of any curl is, is equal to zero. So does that mean that divergence of J is equal to zero no so we need this we need this continuity equation to put it here and the way that we're going to make it work is that uh, by adding this term here in our maxwell's equations in free space if we have a dielectric if we have dielectric then we go back to um, uh, then we uh, use h and d instead of H0 and D0, which mean uh, the corresponding fields in free space. But the good thing with these, val uh, with these values is that when we use divergence of D, it is equal to rho, which is free charges, and this J is 
again, the free current, so you don't have to worry about them being related to um, bound charges. All right, so retarded potential functions. So if you open up any math, uh, any uh, antenna book, any electromagnetics book, you're going to uh, see these equations here, uh, see these derivations here that B is equal to curl of your A, that's by definition, all right? So, but if you put it in your Maxwell's equation, what you're going to get is, is this equation. So, uh, keep that in mind. And we know that if, um, we know that curl of gradient is zero. So wherever we have curl of a vector is equal to zero, it is tempted, it's tempting to assume that that function, this function, is actually equal to gradient of another scalar function. So by assumption, also by uh, using this vector identity, we get here and uh, so let's consider another um, format of, uh, uh, let's consider curl of B. Curl of B is going to curl of, well, B is equal to curl of A. So now what we get from here, uh, from Maxwell's equation, is that this curl of B was actually equal to J over inverse uh, mu zero plus one over C two, uh, derivative of e with respect to t and uh, e here you can replace this e with this equation with this formula so what you get is basically uh, an equation where one side is based on a another side is based on a and this phi and our source our current source. So basically, uh, potential functions. So instead of fields, we have the potential functions here. All right, so let's switch to um, using basically this identity. So curl of curl of A is equal to diver uh, gradient of the divergence minus Laplacian of that field. All right, so let's plug in the num uh, the uh, the previous formula. So, curl of curl is equal to this one. Now, curl of curl is equal to this one. We put it here, and whatever it was from previous page, we put it here. All right, so this is rather more complex complex than what I wanted to have, uh, namely because, may, or mainly because I have two potential functions, a and phi. I want to get rid of one of them at least. So all my terms, or most of my terms have a, so I want to find a way to get rid of this phi here. And if I move this one here to the first side, since this is a cur uh, gradient, this is a gradient, so they go under the same uh, gradient um, operator. And I, if I assume that this holds, this equation holds, then I will simply have this one here. And I show that here, which is called Helmholtz equations, wave equation. So this is based on the assumption that this part that this formula holds. This is called wave equation. All right. So similarly, if if you uh, follow the same path for the potential function of electric field, you're going to end up with a similar function for the scalar phi. All right. So remember, in DC, we had uh, this equation for the potential function. Um, 
and also as you saw we had also if this is j then um, similar equation if this is j similar equation holds for a so what happens in t i'm not going to spend a lot of time here if you're interested how to derive these in a mathematically rigorous way you can refer to this book Electromagnetics by Elliot in 1966, sections 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7. Uh, there has been a reprint of it by IEEE because uh, this book is such a classic that uh, deserves a reprint. So, all this says here is that when you have uh, T, what you're going to end up with is that from source to observation point, there's going to be uh, a lag. So it's going to take you t seconds to see this effect at this point. And that is r over c. r is the distance between uh, source and observation point. And in these equations, they are shown by this formula. All right. These equations that we had here, the Helmholtz equations, are uh, second-order differential equations. They are in, in homogeneous, right? And it's difficult to solve them in that format. Now, if we move from that time domain to frequency domain and use phasers, what's going to happen is that this derivative is going to turn into multiplication by j omega. And any time shift is going to be replaced by by a simple multiplication by e to the j phi. So calculations become simpler. And if we do that, uh, we are going to end up with this as our Helmholtz equations. So k is basically omega k is equal to omega square root of mu epsilon and uh, your vector potential function uh, a is defined in this way and how it's done is that we separate it into different uh, components of the field and calculate them basically separately and then add them up so the simplest scenario that we can now get from here is that there is an infinitesimally small dipole antenna a dipole whose length l is so much smaller than la than lambda than the wavelength that the field propagation uh, 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 along this line becomes uh, unreasonable to consider So if, if the field variations in a time harmonic field, they, they vary by distance, if this is distance. So, and if this takes lambda for uh, one whole cycle of the field to complete, so this length is probably so small covers this section that the observed value of any field here is basically uh, practically constant over the length of this dipole antenna so basically uh, this equation so basically this equation turns into i z uh, which is a constant number I could easily show this with uh, I0. I0. And then basically the integral becomes uh, a simple multiplication by uh, dL, L, or dL. So this becomes your vector potential function. It's as simple as that. Now, it's very common to show this in um, in the spherical format 
to convert a vector field into a spherical so what we need is the values of theta and phi at which we are evaluating these uh, fields and of course the a ax ay and az components and uh, we will get uh, our uh, components in our theta and phi direction and if you do that because we don't have any ax or ay here we only have a z for uh, this vector potential we're going to simply end up with this one with this formula which has only uh, a simple mu r component and a simple uh, mu theta component so getting the magnetic and electric fields is a simple matter of uh, applying the curl operator uh, on them uh, curl of um, a is h and then curl of h uh, uh, divided by j omega epsilon is going to be e so we get these these formula so now one approach of course we we see that we don't have any component in the theta direction so of course now it is very um, conventional uh, where they talk about antenna now uh, we proceed to introduce the concepts of directivity a radiation pattern and such here um, so I'm going to delay that for probably the next lecture so what I'm going to do here is uh, uh, a jump into the concept of dipole antenna the concept of half wave uh, dipole antenna an antenna whose length is long enough that basically is uh, almost uh, half the wavelength La wavelength is um, lambda so if we apply a voltage source at this point as a very, very tiny tiny point here so uh, how this antenna is going to radiate so if we uh, know if we know the current distribution on this we could apply we could break down this antenna into smaller bits and pieces and apply that and basically uh, add them up add them up and find the overall e and h but the first the, the problem to start with is that we don't have that current distribution so current distribution is what we are after the first place all right so how to get that so what I'm going to uh, consider here is that so we say that our dipole antenna is a very thin wire let's say that its radius is practically zero so I divide it into different segments and these blue points are both my observation points and also where I consider the center of each uh, dipole antenna to be and what I say is that I, I assume that uh, each section will have some current I I don't know some current IJ will be associated with each section now these are going to be causing some electric field in Z direction now if we go back to this formula we see that uh, where my uh, theta is zero the um, u theta is uh, the, the component for theta is going to be zero so I'm all and this cosine of theta is going to be one so I'm only going to have R component U R component which is in these directions are only in the Z direction right um, so uh, 
it's wise to think that okay now I'm going to consider the EZ caused by each and every single one of them um, at at this point at this point at this point at this point at, at all the points and I'm going to assume that they are at at any of these points uh, those add up to zero except at the center one which uh, uh, the electric field multiplied by this distance should be the voltage uh, so I say that the it's it's like we had before in the case of the the charge distribution we ignore the effect of uh, one element on itself uh, but it turns out that actually I can't do that I can't ignore that because as as in uh, like um, unlike the uh, point uh, unlike the charged ca uh, the charge case um, where if at a position if at the position of a point charge if I look at it uh, if I am above that uh, the field is going to be in plus direction and uh, if I am below that it's going to be um, in the other direction but here in the case of um, dipole antenna so whether I am above this point or below this point the electric field is in the same direction so basically uh, I can't ignore the effect of the dipole on itself uh, because because actually it's going to be the the strongest field to be considered so I'm a little bit in a trouble here I have to consider another scenario probably uh, I have to consider the fact that this dipole is like a cylinder and I uh, divide it into many different s segments and uh, what I'm going to do is that uh, the red points are going to be so I'm going to assume that the current flows at the center of this radius so, so this is fundamentally different from conventional uh, method of moments in conventional method of moments uh, the current is supposed to be flowing at the surface of the cylinder and is caught and its uh, fields are cal computed by uh, Pocklington integrals so which is a more advanced uh, concept so by the f uh, so so the fact that I'm using this idea that the current flows at the center I am enabling you to understand this at a very early stage of your antenna course all right so this is an important point so current is at the center now I'm going to compute the way the the fields say that I'm interested in this the the uh, the electric field caused by this point by this section of the dipole at this observation point so er and e theta are computed so where is so if uh, this is my y direction this is z direction and the x direction is uh, is from uh, the screen towards um, the reader so your x is going to be zero for observation point your y is equal to a always all right and your zl is going to be uh, this so your zl your your Z, zi was equal to that your zj is going to be the same almost uh, x or is still zero but a y is zero y is zero so then your r distance is given by this formula so when you can move on to here then now you can build functions uh, in c++ to solve this so what are you going to need here to convert 
to convert uh, this this Cartesian mode into spherical so you're going to need another uh, one function now that you have uh, your R in spherical you have to be able to compute the fields ER and E theta so when you compute the fields you have to mix them to get your only EZ because that's where you have to apply your uh, boundary condition tangent tangent field EZ is equal to zero that's what you have to apply and then basically uh, you're going to end up building this function uh, which is of course uh, when it is multiplied by i uh, the current uh, it has to give you the the overall e which is basically zero everywhere on the wire except at the center where you get this one of course there's a negative sign here but depending on how you define this e before proceeding to ask chat gpt to write uh, our initial codes there is one more issue that we have to consider so if we look at our dipole antenna um, from the side and so if uh, these are small uh, dipoles now as you see in this picture I have divided my half wave dipole into five segments which is of course not sufficient just to show the algorithm uh, and so far the algorithm is that we get this infinitesimal dipole and we calculate its field everywhere here on these points but what we're going to see is that when uh, we want to calculate uh, the field of this dipole, this infinitesimal dipole at this point, is that that is not going to be a good representation of this dipole at this point because it's only dependent on this distance. It is highly sensitive to where this dipole is. So if, that, if this dipole, if the position of this dipole is assumed to be slightly higher or lower, that's going to cause a big change in the overall value that we get because simply because uh, R is, uh, the radius is too small here. And this radius is too small. And the end results are so big and so sensitive on where the center of dipole exactly is so what we're going to do i'm going to slice this segment into further subsegments. i don't want to increase the number of n because then uh, solving the problem becomes computationally a lot more expensive so what i do is that uh, i keep the number of unknowns the same same n same uh, same number same five instead i slice that infinitesimal dipole into even smaller infinitesimal dipoles like this and uh, i calculate its field here this one here this one here this one here this one here and then i add this up and what i actually add is uh, the numbers that I get from this equation number five here I show and uh, except that IP all IPs here are the same so before proceeding to actually uh, working with chat GPT and asking for uh, our initial codes which will definitely have to be updated after that uh, it's worthwhile mentioning a few things that phi is going to be between uh, 0 and 2 pi and theta is going to be between uh, 0 and uh, and pi so for this I have to make uh, a few considerations to make sure that uh, this happens properly and uh, 
I divide it into a few sections. One section is that basically if um, uh, x, y, 0 is all zeros. Another section is that, um, another case is that if x and y are 0, but z is not 0. Another one is that if y is equal to 0, but x is not equal to 0, and then elsewhere. So note that I have basically put this formula here. Uh, I'm using actually this Notability Apps um, feature to implement uh, the equations using LaTeX. So the reason is that ChatGPT works very well if you uh, provide this code to it. So if you just copy and paste and uh, ask for ChatGPT to use this algorithm, use this code to uh, and use this code together with this input to provide this output, it's going to provide you with the code. So uh, it is important uh, to write complex algorithms using LaTeX as much as possible. That's the language ChatGPT understands more. So the next step is that when you have R and theta and phi, then you can proceed to actually compute your E, R, and E theta. So of course you're going to need some other inputs as well, but uh, that's, um, that's one of the functions that you have to write. Another function that you're going to have to write is basically uh, when you have uh, e r and e theta at r theta phi, what is your e z? So another function is to basically convert um, your uh, electric field expressed in a coordinate in the spherical coordinate system to uh, electric field expressed in Cartesian coordinate system because it is EZ that we're going to have to make it uh, equal to zero. So one uh, uh, code for that. Another code is that later you're going to see that if I assume that this section is only one dipole antenna and if I want to calculate the field here it's going to be assuming that uh, the position of the dipole is here and uh, so uh, and what's the field here so as you see this is not quite a good representation because as the field is changing that radius to this point is changing a lot so consider this and because it's going to be uh, related to uh, 1 over cube of that distance so it's better actually to divide this uh, section into slices and to get this field as an integral of many uh, different dipoles for that we use uh, some uh, composite simpson rule and uh, the 1 over 3 rule and if you formulate your uh, request to ChatGPT well, you are going to get a decent code out of it. All right. So your main code is basically this um, the section where basically you form your G and then you have your E tangent so whether you have a negative sign here or not it depends on how you have handled the rest of the code so but you uh, you're looking to find this one current distribution so you're going to have to write a code ask chat gpt to write a code for uh, solving this matrix problem so it is now time to implement these algorithms that we spoke about but um, our assumption is that we don't have to master the programming tools before we have to use them. Of course, gradually you're going to have to learn these programming tools, but uh, we're just getting started. So let's start talking about how to use ChatGPT as we have done before to implement these algorithms. So basically you uh, describe your uh, algorithm as detailed as possible. Uh, this is now to uh, ask ChatGPT 
to write a function which inputs x, y, z as in Cartesian coordinates and to give us the um, spherical coordinate system correspondence for those values. And the way to do that is to break down the algorithm using uh, the equations that I showed earlier written in, in, in LaTeX. And the reason for that is that this uh, has a great capability to break it down into different cases and uh, and apparently uh, chat GPT GPT-4 are uh, well designed to work with um, to work with LaTeX and so after putting all the equations which are the ones that you have already seen uh, what it returns us is this function okay so for cases that x y z is zero it returns this um, uh, 0, 0, 0 means that R, theta, phi are all 0. So for the cases that x is 0, y is 0, but z is not 0, it is returning this function, uh, th this value. And uh, for the rest, it is following these equations. And it's providing a, like a main body of code also to, for us to be able to use that, just in case we need to test it. All right. So let's proceed for the other one. And the other one is basically uh, to, to compute the, uh, the electric field values, E theta and uh, ER. So we have a bunch of inputs, which later we're gonna see that we don't need that, uh, those many of inputs. But uh, so, uh, we have the flexibility, of course, to modify our code as uh, we wish. So the code that ChatGPT provides us is is this one. It computes uh, ER and E theta. And notice that these are all complex values. And so is the, of course, the output of uh, uh, the program is also two uh, complex numbers. ER and E theta. The first one is ER, the second one is E theta. All right, and uh, the next thing we want to do is to is to uh, convert this into into uh, EZ because that's a tangent field we're going to be working with. So as you see, I have made a mistake here. I'm multiplying it by R. That should not be the case. Of course, later we're going to modify this right um, now uh, that one we don't need anymore uh, all right so now we want to create our G matrix of course uh, this part is no longer required in fact that's not correct so uh, the way chat GPT is building this matrix is according is according to the request I am uh, making here but later you uh, you can basically yeah uh, okay here where it says that do this calculations when I is not equal to J you can simply just get rid of this if statement here if uh, this conditional um, this condition needs to be uh, removed so that this is computed for all i's and j's. Uh, all right, so then we need to be able to solve this matrix equation. And, uh, and my recommendation to ChatGPT was that use Gaussian elimination method. And it is implementing that method, building uh, one function forward elimination another function called back substitution all right and then uh, the final solver so we don't need to go into the details of these so uh, just know that by calling that final function uh, solver function uh, is basically it's going to solve that matrix equation and you can test it with these simple values of course again all need to be complex numbers
one last step that we forgot to explain is uh, how to obtain the function for uh, composite Simpson's rule. So this is what I wrote for ChatGPT, um, asking it to uh, do a composite Simpson integral of this function uh, from Z A to Z B. All right, and again, notice that it says that n uh, is even. All right, so we have to make sure that before calling this function, n is actually uh, an even number. All right, so it gives us uh, this code. Of course, it assumes that we already have this function. So, composite Simpson, uh, start value, end value, uh, the radius, and some other parameters, the length of the dipole. Uh, and this is the way to implement that method. All right. Another thing we have to do is that after uh, computing all these values, we have to be able to write them down into uh, write them into uh, some text files so later we can plot them. And this is uh, what we do. We ask ChatGPT to write them into some text files which have uh, two columns. One column is uh, b basically the uh, uh, the uh, Z values where we are seeing these currents and uh, the second column is the value of the, the is the absolute value of the um, current all right so and it returns us this answer we need to include uh, one extra header as you see here and uh, so it opens a file and then it writes them into this file all right and uh, we have to also do this in fortran because we are going to compare our results to those of dr Pacnes as uh, as in his book as in the website of his book uh, he, he has included uh, some codes with the conventional method of moments so we're going to uh, ask ChatGPT to do the same uh, for a Fortran code for that Fortran code. And uh, so the values of Z and the current is given here. So this is how to open the file and this is how to write into that file. So uh, choosing the same number here you're writing into that file and then you have to close the file uh, one last item is that basically of course I was having some problems with this this was not readily working so I had to go back and forth with ChatGPT to make this work and uh, uh, some issues too so uh, the next item is to uh, open these and to, to plot them using um, GNU plot. So we have to make a plot and uh, we want to use GNU plot to do that. So we ask to make uh, the original one, of course. Uh, sorry about that, yeah. <coughs> so it's, it seems like I have already... <coughs> All right, so here's a code. Write a code in Groom plot which opens the above mentioned two files and plots the current against Z on the same figure with the same black color but different line styles and saves it into an EPS file. All right, so it simply provides a code that works. And if I want to show you how this plot is going to look, I could actually move this uh, here and show you. So if you look at this plot here, this one plot is what is going to look like. 
uh, as you, you use that code provided by uh, by ChatGPT, which is fairly good. So this means that these two lines that you see here are lying on top of each other. So the only problem I have with this is that these markers, cross and and plus markers, are lying exactly on top of each other at the same points. So what I want uh, is that to to separate them to make them appear at different points to make it well more visible that I'm using two types of markers. So going back and forth with uh, ChatGPT regarding the GNU plot code, it first provides me a code that is wrong. It just shifts the data and then back and forth again. So I end up uh, having the code that I needed and getting the plot that I wanted. So now I would like to show you uh, what the final version of the codes look like. What the final version of the codes look like. So here uh, in the main body of the code, a few parameters are uh, defined. Lambda is put equal to one. Uh, which means that our frequency is uh, 300 megahertz and length of the dipole instead of uh, half of lambda is equal to 0 0.47 so later we're, we're going to talk about why I'm choosing these these values uh, probably uh, in the next video I will uh, be going into more details about this and the diameter of the wire and uh, I am dividing this into, well, 2 times 20 plus 141 segments. So 41 unknown currents I will have. I want to compute that. Uh, and uh, so my uh, compute E tangents. So E tangents along this wire are, uh, are computed using this function. And the values of the G matrix is, is computing using these functions. I will go over these later all right and uh, so now this is this line is used to compute uh, to solve that matrix equation and I'm opening a file and writing the values of Z and currents into that file all right and one more thing I'm doing here is that I am also I am also printing out uh, the values of uh, the uh, the input impedance so if you come here the results and I myself made some mistakes regarding whether to put this negative sign here or not because it's easy to forget that in your ETANs you uh, if your input voltage is supposed to be 1 volts it's easy to forget that here uh, at your E10, where you compute your E10, you have to uh, include a negative sign in front of that uh, voltage over distance. So if you forget that, then you're going to have to fix it here. So some pitfalls I include here, so so you know that where you have to be careful. So what I get here is that basically my uh, input function, my um, Z naught is is this one. As you see, it is very close to what I wanted. 75 ohms is the input impedance of the ideal dipole. So the imaginary part is supposed to be uh, well zero, but here it's a very small number, so it's acceptable. So so there are some practical. Uh, imperfections here uh, all right and uh, this is later I'm going to run the code and compare it with what Dr. Packings gets so so we are sure that we are getting the same values but uh, for now let's go and see how this compute ETANs work so it's very simple it works in this way 
uh, that it's zero everywhere except at uh, k underscore prime its value is defined by that voltage which I assume to be 1 divided by delta Z and and uh, and the reason for that is uh, and, and the reason that I have K underscore prime here not prime uh, not K plus 1 is that this in C plus plus the arrays start with 0 so uh, when you are dealing with uh, with that concept so uh, this is basically your k plus one uh, element. All right, let's go back to the main code and let's see how g is computed now. Your g is computed uh, by well, uh, by doing a composite Simpson integral. And why do you do that? As I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, it is uh, necessary to avoid some problems, which happen when you try to get the field of this dipole uh, at this point. So when i and j are equal, so you're going to have a problem there. So in and it's going to be very dependent on the position of this dipole that you compare. A is so small that small changes in A will lead to big big changes in the overall current caused by that dipole. So for example, if the center of this dipole is slightly up or down, you're going to have big changes. So instead of uh, instead of that option, uh, instead of just using simple dipole for that, one attempt is to basically divide the whole thing into much smaller dipoles so I get that change but then if I uh, keep increasing the number of segments I have that means that I have a much bigger matrix to solve and that becomes computationally very expensive also it becomes almost uh, well it becomes such that a lot of your uh, values in your G matrix are going to be very small and the ones that are close to your observation points are going to be very large so that's also um, a an important numerical consideration to avoid so the solution for that is that when my I equals my J so what happens or well for all cases in this matter so it's better to just assume that I have much smaller dipoles I I divided into smaller segments here but the key is that now all of them are going to have the same current so I I integrate I I average the the effect of all these dipoles on this observation uh, point and that's done using composite Simpson's 1 over 3 rule and this is what it does here. So let's go to its definition. And all right. So yeah, I wanted to show you something that I forgot and where it starts. It, it starts from Z, Z A to Z B and uh, this is my matching point uh, or my observation point. So uh, uh, DZ2 is um, the length of the dipole divided by number of segments divided by 2. So it's, it's uh, if my Z source before uh, was this number, now I am going uh, slightly less than that and slightly more than that uh, so that I can actually uh, compute uh, this integral. 
All right. Composite Simpson rule as this code was also done by ChatGPT. So the key point here is that if your uh, n slices is is uh, is odd, it should be converted into uh, an even number. All right. So I don't want to go into the details, but this is what it looks like when you do the composite Simpson integral. So it adds the values and so let's see what this function does all right so what this function does is basically it gives you uh, the ez of uh, a dipole antenna uh, so the ez of the dipole antenna are given again considering this fact that you uh, that the observation points are always at this radius at y equals a x equals x is equal to zero and at these z values and your current is at the center here so it's easy to calculate your r and uh yeah so the uh the capital r is calculated in cartesian coordinate system with this line here and then we convert it into Cartesian to a spherical. As you see, we got this code from ChatGPT. And uh, so then we uh, compute the fields at R theta phi. And uh, then we get the Z component of that field here. That basically sums up the entire uh, code. But to make sure that if you want to write your own code, you will be able to do so. I'm going to show you the entire code. So you may want to pause and write your uh, copy and paste as you wish. Some constants is is defined of course you have to include all these headers and then some constants are defined so this function probably i'm not sure if it's uh, required anymore probably not uh spherical to cartesian to spherical all right compute fields gives you ER and E theta. EZ, compute EZ. So as you see that in when I was uh, asking ChatGPT, I had made a mistake in uh, defining the algorithm and had the include here R times this value. Now I have removed it. So this is a summarized version of uh, EZ as I explained the algorithm here. So you can have a look at the code. All right, Composite Simpson. All right, uh, this one you don't need probably. Compute G is the one you need. All right. Compute E tens. Forward elimination code. Back substitution and uh, solving the matrix. So the few lines here in the main body of the code is basically you don't need them, don't use them. So start from here. I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to to make sure that that matrix solution is correct. I'm doing that multiplication. So you don't have to do that. And you don't have to print to the screen uh, the values of your current or, well, um, 
the results so to make sure that these are going to be similar to etans and you have to include this line only to get your z input impedance and this is the code uh, done by dr packneys So you can download the code. I'm going to show you the modifications I have made to it. And it is not that big. So I open the file. I write the values of the current into it. And then I simply close the file. That's the modifications I have made to the code. So it's time to run our codes, the codes that we have created uh, with the help of ChatGPT and we have modified as I showed before. Uh, then we will run uh, the codes that I have shown that we have received from uh, the website of uh, the book or from Dr. Packneys. Um, and then we will compare the results. So as I showed you before, uh, this is the codes that we have created uh, with getting help from ChatGPT. And now we simply would like to run this code. All right. So it's compiling, built successfully. Now it's running. Okay, finished running. So uh, what we are interested in here seeing is that the uh, input impedance is 75. Its uh, real value is 75 ohms and uh, the imaginary value is minus 2.4. So that's also good. And what we are also interested in, so these results uh, are basically 
uh, my way of checking that that matrix solution was correct so if this is correct which seems to be now correct everywhere it's going to be zero or almost zero as you see these are uh, this number times to uh, times 10 to the power of minus 15 minus 15 here so so these are very small numbers it's going to be different at the center uh, where we have that voltage source so everywhere else it's almost zero that's good and the currents are very small when we come to the edge of uh, the uh, to the endpoints of our dipole antenna as you see here and at center it's going to be the maximum uh, so now it's time to compare uh, with what we get from conventional method of moments as uh, done by Dr. Packneys here. So when you download his codes, you're going to see that there is a couple files that you need. So there is this file, molar underscore m uh, and constants underscore m. So these are from uh, this folder utils. Uh, one is here and the other one is uh, constants so you're going to have to copy these files into I guess this was in chapter 6 folder yeah so now I, I, I have already copied them here so constants um, and uh, this file and what we our main file here is uh, wire.f so you compile it using this command and then you run the code you run the result file all right so as you see here uh, your um, input impedance is almost the same as what you got here and uh, let's say that we want to compare the current values as well I'll say that the the endpoints are a very small number so it's not a good idea to compare these but still uh, 1.0 uh, 67 times to the power of, uh, times 10 to the power of minus 3 so surprisingly they are almost the same at the center point this is uh, say it's 1.3 uh, times 10 to minus 2 1.3 yeah so we get the same results so this is interesting uh, because the method that we used, method of, uh, let's call it method of forces, uh, the key difference was that it assumes that the current is not uh, distributed at the outer surface of a cylinder, uh, that cylinder being your wire. Uh, it, is, uh, it is assumed that this current flows at the center of the wire and we compute EZ at the surface and to do that we don't need um, other more difficult concepts of uh, a current uh, being on the surface of a cylinder which will need uh, more advanced methods to solve what we need here when the current is uh, only at the center along Z axis what we need here is uh, only the infinitesimally small dipole antenna and uh, that we have uh, as our first step of entering uh, the antenna course after Maxwell's equations and getting the vector potential function so that's the key point that you make that assumption you don't lose accuracy at least in this case all right it is time to um, plot these data and compare them with each other so as you see here if you uh, 
get the list of the files that are in this folder after we have run uh, conventional method of moments so uh, this file is created that's the name of the file that uh, in the code uh, um, wire.f so that's the name of the file that we ask to we ask the code to create uh, here all right so so what I'm going to do is that I, I have copied this file to the position of the file, to the location of the file that uh, my other uh, file had uh, been this current MOF method of forces. So this was created by, of course, uh, this part of the code here. current MOF so the results the current distribution was written into that file so now they are both in uh, this location all right so as I showed uh, the GNU plot file is going to use both of them and uh, to compare them with each other so when you run uh, your GNU plot code using this command so you are going to get a file that is called uh, EPS okay so final new current plot EPS is what is created in that file all right so this is all right this file here is going to be your end result I am working on just uh, summarizing what we have talked about in this video in this document I'm not sure if I will submit it for publication or not maybe I will uh, but this is the end result it shows that uh, these points marked with X are method of forces and the other one marked with well uh, th there are two lines there are two lines one line is marked with uh, X's the other line is marked with uh, plus signs but they lie on top of each other so it means that everywhere the current distribution is the same so if you uh, like this video, if you don't want to miss the next lecture, please subscribe to this channel and hit the like button. Thank you so much.